Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys Varsity Tennis Team for 22 years, and we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My book, Beyond the Lines, is about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness, which is what this show is all about. My special guest today has a legendary TV career. She is the president and CEO of PBS Hawaii, and her name is Leslie Wilcox. And today we are going beyond public broadcasting. Leslie, so great Thank to see you. you. The, that's very kind. Thank you so much. I think you're the queen of TV. Oh, hardly, but thank you. Thank you. I grew up, honestly, Leslie, I grew up watching you on TV. And so I know you're the queen of TV. So well, good to have you. Lots of live TV. So I'm sure you've seen all my mistakes. As well. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see any mistakes whatsoever. But I want to know, I know you grew up in Hawaii. Can you tell me about your youth growing up? Sure. I grew up in... Uh, Kulio O Valley and then New Valley when Kulio O was the really the last suburban kind of valley, although we had farms and Quonset huts too. But um, Hawaii Kai wasn't built yet. Can really? you imagine? So it was, that's the last valley before Hawaii Kai and Mauna Lua Bay hadn't been built up. So it meant that when waves were big, they'd wash over the quote highway, which yeah. was small, high, little highway, and uh, stirred up the fish pond. And we could go fishing on the highway for dinner. No way. Hot mullet. It was an intact fish pond. It was terrific. And so I grew up um, lots of freedom as a kid because it was a safe. This is old times. And so my brothers and I went hiking and swimming. And I remember in the morning, we'd cross Kalani on the Oli Highway as little kids. And we'd go to this little island off Kulio O where uh, fishermen would throw aku heads after catching them and we'd have aku <laughs> sword fights and, and of course you would get bloody and then we'd walk back along the highway and people would go are you all right little girl <laughs> and everyone wanted to clean you up and make sure you're okay but it was just a very family environment to live in in Kulio. so what schools did you attend so i started in holy nativity in aina haina but then my family ran out of money so uh I was happy to go to Aina Haina Elementary, New Valley Intermediate, and then Kalani High School. Lived in that area all my life. What kind of activities or sports did you did you participate in? I ran track, and I but then I fell in love with surfing. A, a neighbor boy made a board that he didn't like, and he actually gave it to me. And um, yeah, it turns out he gave it to me because it actually kind of leaned right. <laughs> but still, I was thrilled to have it. You walk across the highway. That was our playground. Across the highway was the beach and the water. And um, I, I did surf. There weren't that many girls surfing at the time. We were kind of novelty items. And I wasn't very good, but I, I did love it. I loved the water. It was always around water. Nice. Now And lots of hiking. We, oh. It's amazing how uh, people, you know, I, I still go hiking where I used to hike as a kid. I never see anybody anymore. It used to be full of kids and making forts and having fun. I love hiking. I want to. I want to do hiking more because one when I finally hike, I'm thinking I got to do this it's more so often. It's so beautiful, so peaceful. Yes. Now, what college did you end up going to? So I went to the University of Hawaii. I actually, got a scholarship to USC, but I did have a, um, and as many people do, uh, they were family issues. Um, it, Actually, um, how I grew up it actually helped me as a journalist because what happened was my father was absentee and there was a passel of kids in the house and we were, you know, we we uh, had to really scrimp and save. So we, we didn't have uh, hot water for years at oh, a time wow. because of the water bill. And I know I could make a mean meatloaf with very little meat in it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, that just, but nobody in the neighborhood knew. We, the kids, we didn't know what was normal and what wasn't. We just didn't say anything. And so I, when I became a journalist, maybe that's why I became a journalist, I really knew that what things looked like wasn't necessarily what they were. And, um, and I, as I look at how many people are struggling to make ends meet here in Hawaii today, I know what it's like to not know if you're going to be able to live in the place you know, you grew up tomorrow, you're going to might lose your place. Yeah. So it gives you a, a sensitivity and, a, and an awareness that, you know, look deeper. Well, so your meatloaf had a lot of loaf and less meat. Yes, very, very, <laughs> lots of bread. Yeah. Of bread. <laughs> so Leslie, I have to ask this. What was the first job that you've ever had? Okay, well, 
when I was a teenager, we didn't have all these McDonald's and Burger Kings and McDonald's was just starting out in Hawaii. And uh, I mean, there were, it was really hard for kids to get jobs. Uh, so my first job actually turned out to be in Waikiki. And I was a, first a hostess and then a waitress at this little snack shop on the grounds of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's, and that's, that again, helped prepare me for journalism because you had to do all kinds of things at once, you know, yeah. you had to have a lot of situational awareness and, um, keep a lot of things on your, your mind. And that's what I did for until I got a job in, in news. So let's go there now. Let's talk about how your amazing journalism, TV broadcasting career started. How did it all begin? You know, uh, very inauspiciously and very fluky at a very young age. What happened is when I was at Kalani High School, there were all these news competitions and I, I won uh, the writing part of I run a writing competition. The Honolulu Star Bulletin, which was then the largest newspaper in Hawaii, sent me on my first trip to the mainland to compete in a really prestigious competition for high school juniors, seniors, and college freshmen and sophomores. Wow. It was like a, you were there for a week and you, you, had to, you had to do everything, write an editorial on deadline, cover a football game on deadline, interview somebody, get an interview and interview somebody and turn it in on deadline. Everything was... Deadlines. Yes, it was all <laughs> deadlines and it was all, you know, I, I didn't really know how to play football all that well. <laughs> so I had to cover a game. So, but um, on, I was shocked out of my seat when I actually won that. And um, the Star Bulletin paid my way and I found myself unable to go to college because there were family difficulties. And um, I applied for a job as a gopher. I said, look, I know I want to do this. I'm not qualified, but can you can I sweep the floor? Can I get you <laughs> coffee? What can I do? And the, the city editor of the time, a man named, a very distinguished man named Ed Edwards, told me, are you kidding? <laughs> you know, go get an education and then come back. And I said, okay, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. And, um, and then I, and I also told him, and as soon as I get out of this newsroom, I'm going to take off these pantyhose. <laughs> They're not worth wearing. I, I shouldn't have even put them on. <laughs> and, you know, four months later, he called me. I was still waitressing. And he said, um, okay, I got to go for a job for you. You can you can do errands at the state capitol bureau for the legislative reporters. And that's how I started when I was uh, 18 years old. Wow, that's amazing. And then when I was barely 19, it's a it's a long story, but um, one of our one of my colleagues called in sick and he said, Go go check out these committees. And it turns out in this obscure committee, this major news story broke, and I was the only news related person in the world, such as I mean in the room, such as I was. And yeah. so I, I I cobbled together a story and it ended up being the banner headline. Wow. And um so when um, a, a, a another when a reporter went out on maternity leave, they said I could I could slide in for you know four months and then don't get don't get comfortable because then you're out of here and then they just never tapped me on the shoulder and told me to go. Wonderful. <laughs> I mean, if you, I mean, who would ever have, you can't plan that? And I was very grateful. Well, I love I love hearing your stories, and you know, I don't I don't care if your stories are short or long. I mean, <laughs> you go, Leslie. <laughs> now, so what what TV news organizations were you a part of? Okay, so after the Honolulu Star Bulletin, I worked for um, Bob Seavey, who was running a, uh, you know, the, the golden station of Hawaii at the time. And I was so proud that he hired me because so many people wanted the job. And of course, I didn't know anything about TV. Um, and, you know, I learned on the job. He had a 75% share of the market, which is unheard of. And learned a lot from really good people. He, he hired all these terrific people, and I just soaked it in. I worked there for 15 years and became a, I, and my goal was never to become an anchor, but I, um, along the way, they threw me in on a weekend and kept me there. So I, I kind of moved up in that sense, but I always loved reporting more than anything, being out and about, and I love the deadline. Wow. So you were at KGMB for 15 years? 15. And then um, I was hired by Channel 2 yeah. to start the first extended morning newscast in Hawaii. So, uh, you know, we, at Channel at Channel 9, we only had two newscasts, 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock, and it was packed with really good information, uh, very well staffed. And, but, the, you know, the, that's when news stations were starting to expand the time. 
and actually make more money on commercials, yeah, right? Yeah. So with a morning newscast, you could expand the number of commercials in half hours. And we went from an hour to three and a half hours. Jeez. I was the executive producer and I had just a great team of people just pounding out work every half hour continuously. So you've, I mean, you've done reporting, you've done, you know, anchoring, you've done producing, editing. Is there anything that you didn't do? Actually, I've done copy editing, copy but I've editing. never done video editing. Oh. It was always a union job in those days. Oh. I, I was, you know, executive producer, assistant news director. So I've seen different ends of the business. So in terms, if we go back to Bob CV, because I remember growing up and watching Bob CV on the news, what, what did you learn from him? from him that I could never do what he did and you know um, he was a very uh, he, he was an amazing guy who could ad lib his way through anything and that's the test of an anchor right they things are breaking loose all over but you don't know that they just have a great demeanor and they make you feel safe um, but um, I was really terrible at television as I watched Bob because you know he came from all this experience and he kind of in a sense with all that experience he kind of talked like I'm, I'm Olympus, and here you go. Here's the information, <laughs> not in a, you know, not in a bad way, but that's just the seasoning. And then I realized, and I couldn't do that. I didn't know that much. All I knew was the story I worked on that yeah. day. So I, I, the way I became better at television was I sat at my computer and I wrote. I, I said in my mind, "Hey, Auntie, this is what's important that happened today." <laughs> that was my preface in my head, and then I wrote it in a way that was. Um, eye to eye, Personal. person to person, mm -hmm. not, um, you know, not I'm, here's what, here's what you should know, but here, here's what, here's what happened. I just want you to know about it. It, it. it felt right to me. Did Bob give you any like unique words of wisdoms uh, when you first started your career? He did. <laughs> he told me I knew what I was doing and I could beat opponent, uh, beat the, the other, the competition on stories. But I needed to, one, get the local inflection out of my voice. And I went, what? Is that a local inflection? <laughs> hey. <laughs> and he said, here's what you do. He says, you don't speak pigeon, but you have a local inflection because when you ask a question, your cadence is this. Da 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 da. <laughs> he says, you know, a question goes up at the end. You know that, right? <laughs> so he told me that. And then I later I, I couldn't really, I, I sounded so sing songy. I didn't sound natural. So I went to him for advice. I said, what can I do? I mean, you're so natural, and all the other people here are just so good. And yeah. he said, you know, this is one of those businesses where you, Leslie, and I thought, oh, good, I'm going to get the light. Yeah. So he said, you sink or swim. <laughs> and I, I, I was really worried about that point. <laughs> well, fortunately, you were swimming ever since that moment. After I realized that my job is not to be like, it was mostly men in the industry who'd been trained on the mainland and been great reps. And um, I, I just learned you have to be yourself. Yeah, well, you are so credible. You're so respected in the TV news industry. And now, as the president and CEO of PBS Hawaii, which you became president and CEO in 2007. Right. Can you share with me about like the wonderful things that you did since becoming president and CEO? Well, you don't do anything alone yeah. <laughs> when you're the president and CEO of PBS Hawaii. It's, it's a small and dynamic team and we have faced constant changes. Media is like that and more so in the age of the internet. Obviously I used to type on a manual computer but, but now, um, you know, we've moved from analog transmission to uh, digital transmission. We've, it's, it's required a lot of money to change systems. We, uh, a high definition was the equivalent of a heart transplant on a person. I mean, we did that. Um, so a lot of the things I, I, I went there because I was so interested in providing more local programming. But as soon as I got there, there was a recession in 2008. Oh, yeah. And then we lost our lease at the UH Manoa. So... Um, even though I worked very hard on expanding with our team, um, expanding and uh, improving pro local programming, we really had to keep our, our business and our, our, our nonprofit um, you know, moving forwards because you don't get anywhere in media when you're behind. Well, you know, some years ago, you won the Ho'okele Award, which is the top award in nonprofit leadership. How did that make you feel to be finally recognized as one of our state's great leaders. I, you know, awards, I, I'm, I'm very suspicious of awards. I'm <laughs> thrilled to get one, but I, 
you know, I know there are tons of other wonderful people and, I, you know, you always feel like, do they, did they really call my name? <laughs> I, uh, I think I was, you know, you just have to, you just have to say, that's a, this is a wonderful moment. I always have to prove myself and um, do, do a better and better job. Well, and the new facility that you guys have at San Island is absolutely beautiful. And I know that you were very instrumental in making all that happen. But can you share more about some of the more recent things that you guys are doing at PBS now? Uh, well, we um, we are we just started something. You know, we're an educational nonprofit, so uh, we do educational media. So we we wanted to do. Uh, a literacy program that was different and so what we do is we invite people in the community in and they bring their favorite book excerpt or poem or anything that they want to read and um it's different from most literacy programs because normally you know read alouds are here here's a book read this yeah. this is they're sharing what they feel is really important to them and we give it a spin with animation and it's just share you know people share what's super meaningful to them and we finding them connecting with each other and where do you get that book and what part was that and <laughs> it's really been a wonderful uh interaction doing that so that's a, that's a simple thing we've done recently uh we've also done kako have a east town hall where we got people who are very different and may not even like each other in the same room live to talk about difficult issues and also uh, another forum called what's it going to take based on you know these grim statistics that the that that research has uh, uncovered and the Hawaii Community Foundation has done a change framework around it telling us we've got some serious problems and this is the time we need to act so we, we we're doing a continuing series of programs called what's it going to take yeah I love hearing that and speaking of books, Leslie, you know, in my book, Beyond the Lines, you are someone that definitely go beyond the lines. I want to know what principles stood out in the book for you. Okay, I really related to what you did in many ways. Um, you, you, were, you were taking outstanding tennis players who, who, were, who were individual standouts. Mm -hmm. And through discipline and teaching them, I think, humility, too, Somehow, I don't really for sure know how you did it because there's a secret sauce in it. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I love it that their identities became not just, hey, this is me, I'm the best this. It became, we're a great team. And to do that, you, uh, an outstanding individual has to give opportunities to other people yeah. to recognize that somebody else may be better at this than he or she is, right? Yeah, totally. I, you're totally right. And making it happen. I mean, it's one thing to say that's what you did, but I don't, you know, how you did it is very incredible. And to do it again and again and again. Oh, boy, that was hard work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what was the secret sauce? I think it's, you know, my top priority was to develop champion athletes of character first and then great tennis players second. And every day, that's what I wanted to try to do is to make sure that I'm helping them with life's lessons and doing the right thing. And there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. And I think that's what you do with PBS in terms of building your team because character is so important. And yeah. when I went to visit your PBS studio, I mean, all of your, your team, they're so nice. They have great character. They do. They do. They, they are the kind of people that uh, if you were in a, in a crazy situation, they would come to, they would come and help you and they would do whatever it took and they would be really resourceful in doing so. Leslie, I, I love your long story short TV episodes. I mean, can you tell me about how, how all that started? You know, uh, it wasn't my idea. It was uh, the idea came from Mike, Michael Harris, who is a uh, well-known director at local television. And he approached me while I was a, uh, a journalist at KHON2 and said, hey, could you come and do a, a contract a gig over here, uh, hosting a show? Uh, it'll be about, you know, people's character and, you know, what made them the way they are. And I said, oh, what kind of resources are you putting into? And he goes, well, we can't give you any video, but you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I wasn't into that. I like, I like visuals. I like video. <laughs> and um, so I, I said, oh, no, I, I'm good with my job here. And that he, uh, he approached me a couple times. And then I got hired there as, as president. And he, and he said, you know what? We <laughs> still have that puka on Tuesday nights. So we need to fill. So let's do it. And that's how it happened. I, I, and I, I gave it the name, uh, long story short, and decided I wasn't really into talking to um, 
picking people on the basis of how successful they were in conventional terms. What I wanted to know was um, how did they get to be the way they are? You know, what values, what, what, uh, what formative decisions did you make? How, what did you do when you made a mistake? How did you, you know, what was your trajectory? Because you find out so much about people and it's not what you think. Yeah. Well, I, I think that you're the master queen TV interviewer. I am so not. You are. Okay, here's you what are. I, my daughter <laughs> said to me, Mom, do they actually pay you for that show? And I said, no, they don't. And she said, good. And I said, what? And she said, because you say things like, and then what happened? And so? <laughs> and she said, you know, you don't ask those big, long, impressive questions. And I said, yeah, because I don't really like them. Said, You're right, I don't. <laughs> I want to ask you, <laughs> what makes an interview great? You know, I think it's um, just, a, 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 there's an understanding that passes between interviewer and interviewee. And one time I was interviewing this boxer who didn't, he didn't really want to be interviewed. Somebody kind of said, you got to go on. Yeah. And, um, we were, we were having a, a duel of the eyes <laughs> for minutes. It's like, you know, because I knew he had more to share, but he didn't want to. Uh -huh. and, was, and, we were, and I was giving him the eye, <laughs> and he was giving me the eye. <laughs> and you can see it on TV, too. And, and then he decided, okay, I think I trust her. I'm going to do it. What the heck? Yeah. And then it became really, you know, when people want to share, and they've had an opportunity to think about their lives, it, it becomes just amazing. And, you know, I, I really want to give viewers the idea that they're they're the ones at the table, not me talking to the, to the interviewee. Yeah, got it. As CEO, what do you feel the best leaders do? Well, if appropriate, I think mm -hmm. the best leaders uh, lead from the back. Mm -hmm. You know, they basically, uh, you know, work with the team to set a vision and then they set the goals and then and then they trust professionals to forage and find a way. And, uh, you know, obviously with checks along the way, but they, I hate the word empower because I mean, it's so overused, but yeah. empower people. Yeah. Now I want to ask you, Leslie, why are you successful? Uh, well, I don't know that there's a, uh, I don't know if everyone agrees that I'm successful. But, I think um, we all agree. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think, um, and I'm, I'm, I say this, uh, I've thought about, um, how lucky I am in the sense that all along, it's like, I feel like I've surrounded by a village of like you say, decent, caring people who care about getting things done well. And um, they've inspired me to be better myself. And they've shown me how far you can go and um, how failure need not be, you know, if you can, you could fail and get right up, dust yourself off. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've just been very, very fortunate. And I don't know if I could have, um, than what I do in another state that where I wasn't um, surrounded by people who really care about each other. Very, I know we're, we're a, you know, this is a state of great interdependence. We're an island state and um, it's, you feel vulnerable, but then you also feel such strength from it. Yeah, I totally get that. Now I wanna ask you, every successful person, they deal with certain adversities and challenges along the way. What's one of your biggest challenges or adversities that you have to deal with? Well, maybe because of the field I was in, uh, being I was I was a news anchor much of the time, and uh, you you know you, news anchors often are really worried about their popularity because ratings transfer to money and position, and I learned pretty quickly that don't care about what other people think, just do what you think is the right thing because chances are. Those people, you know, forgot what they said right after they said it, or you heard it wrong, or what are you going to do about it anyway? And I, I've always tried very hard never to take personal offense. It's really not my business what other people think of me. And often I find out that I made the wrong conclusion when somebody says something. So that takes a lot of angst out of life. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it's like water off a duck's back. Now, you've done so many amazing interviews, you, you've covered so many stories. Is there one interview or one story that kind of stands out among all the other great ones? Uh, it's, it's a long involved story. It has to do with the um, just an amazing woman I met who had been um, raped and sodomized and shot in the head by uh, a former organized crime guy who got, who got the apartment wrong and just did that to her. Oh no. And, and, but it was a story of how she survived testified against him and um, just, you know, one thing you get to see in the job I have is just incredible personal reserves. 
people who defy the odds and they, you know, by sheer dint of faith or personal belief or whatever it is that, that inspires them, you see some amazing people. And, and she was a seemingly ordinary um, office worker in Honolulu. Well, and she was just in the wrong room. Yeah, basically. she ended up having to go into witness protection when when he was free putting a contract out on her life, and she never backed down. Wow! I just was so impressed because it wasn't just a brief moment of heroism for her. It took years. I mean, I wish I had a shorter example, but that no, that uh, makes sense. Wow, that's impactful. Very much so, and then, but you know, you see it all the time where people facing very tough odds. You know, I don't know what prepares them for it, but. They are able to rise above, and there are people who don't get headlines. I, I see them, I and mean, I've covered many traffic accidents and shootings and social justice uh, infractions, and you see a lot of people who have more than you could ever know. Yeah, and you know, that, that's so much of their mindset, because I find, I find that, you know, when your back is against the wall, you're either going to go one or two ways. You're either going to be the victim mindset, or you're going to have a victor mindset. Exactly, exactly. You know, and I think that's when you really know how, you know, how right. good you really are in terms of your perspective and your, your will. It's funny because my high school friends, we all had a, we rated people according to if things got really bad, who would have your back? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Because <laughs> sometimes you need that in life. Oh, we do. Now, besides Bob CV, who are some other people that inspire you? Well, uh, I Today or always? Anytime. I, I mean, the, the early women in television here, I mean, you know, they, it was a different time and uh, they're still around, like Linda Koval, oh, Emma yeah. Timinbaugh. I mean, they just learned as they went and they, there was some definite chauvinism involved, mm. uh, you know, and so many, and, and people behind the scenes who are in a position to do something brave and they, and they did. Wow. So, well, I mean, and you're inspiring tons of people in this generation as well. I know that. I just try to be decent and um, and hold everybody to that around me. Yeah, you because you go beyond the lines. <laughs> <laughs> you have that high standard of excellence and everybody sees that. Leslie, I want to ask one more question. What gives you fulfillment? Oh, good question. Um, you know, in this world, uh, not everyone has the opportunity to be understood and you know loved and accepted. And um, I just feel really fortunate. I have a small circle of friends and family uh, who do get me and they like me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know that it's, it, you know you don't I don't you never take that for granted. No, I love hearing that. It's all about I mean that's that's the realness. I mean that's really what keeps us fulfilled. Yeah. And, and, and I've often uh, talked with people who they say nobody is ever understood them yeah. yeah leslie i want to thank you for joining me thank on you. the show today i mean what a pleasure thank you sharing your insights i mean i learned a lot about you right i here. learned a lot about you and your book. <laughs> and you've got another one coming out so i'll be watching that yeah it's going to come out shortly so but thank you leslie not at all thank you so much Rusty. it was a pleasure being here with you and your guests and thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. And a special thank you to my clothing sponsor, Iolani Incorporated. For more information, please visit RustyKamori.com. And my book is available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. I hope that Leslie and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.